Good day from New York. My name is Dr. Leon Perlman. I'm the head of the Digital Financial Services Observatory at Columbia Business School. Um, and welcome to one of the great webinars in our series that we've been uh, running for the past few months. Uh, today's webinar is an introduction to the faster payment systems and implications for emerging economy payment systems. We're very lucky to have Dr. Brad Pragnell uh, presenting. Um, he is currently in Australia late at night, so uh, thank you to him for uh, staying up late for us. So today's agenda, um, we're going to do a quick overview of the DFSO, then we're going to go into the live webinar, it's about 45 minutes. We're going to do two quick polls, and then we're going to do a live 15-minute Q&A after the presentation the poll. So please send the um, questions to the moderator and host. Um, uh, for those who've been participants for a while, you'll know that there's an optional live quiz post-webinar. It's a 10-question multiple-choice quiz just after the Q&A ends, so look out for the quiz link in the instruction email uh, for the webinar which you received. To note that the quiz is live for only two hours uh, post-webinar for certificate purposes. After two hours, the quiz results will not count for certificate purposes. Um, to get through and pass the, 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 the quiz well, you need to concentrate on the slides uh, that are coming up. All the um, information are in the slides itself. So please pay careful attention if you want to get through the, um, the quiz. So just about the uh, uh, observatory, uh, you can go see us at dfsobservatory.com. Uh, we have a very extensive uh, database and it's updated um, uh, uh, quite frequently. Um, this is some of the DS DFSO activities. We have this database I spoke about. We're doing some model laws and regulations, one on blockchain law and another on uh, uh, MOU um, between regulators. Uh, we do webinars and, and roundtables. We have the annual DFS and Emerging Payment Summit, which was held uh, in, in, in June this year. Uh, commentaries and analysis of new regulations, and we do close collab collaboration with industry regulators and academics. Um, I'll go through this later, but if you want to take a look at the events page on the uh, dfsobservatory.com, we have uh, these webinars which are confirmed up to uh, mid-November. Uh, the next one is on interoperability in DFS on, on sep September the 2nd. And again, uh, this is the certificate that you can earn. Um, you need to do um, six webinars and obtain 60% uh, on the quiz for each webinar that you attend. So the quiz has to be attached to the webinar that you attend. So um, we're going to go on to the, um, the webinar itself now, and I want to introduce Dr. Brad Pragnall. He's a good friend of the DFS Observatory. Uh, you'll see that he, if you go to our archives, he did an introduction to payment systems back in May, and he was also a panelist at the recent DFS uh, summit uh, in, in June. He consults to Payments Canada as part of the Payments Modernization Initiative, and he was previously head of the industry policy and the Australian Payments Clearing Association. Uh, and as you can see, he's very well qualified uh, um, to do so. So um, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Dr. Pragnall. He's going to talk about um, what are faster payment systems, examples of faster payment systems around the world, design features, recent trends, future developments, and key issues for policymakers. And please don't forget to send in your uh, questions as we go along. Over to you, Dr. Pregnal. Um, hello there. Can everyone hear me? I think that's uh, taking that as a good sign. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Leon, um, for that introduction. Um, it's been very good uh, being involved with DFSO at uh, Columbia over the past couple of months. Uh, as Leon mentioned, I did a webinar back in May on an introduction that's available from the website. Um, and you can you can go through that material and also the summit back in June, which was great. I'd just like to be uh, make a quick disclaimer that uh, all of the um, comments uh, and uh, views that I'll be providing in today's uh, webinar are personal views. Uh, they're not views of Payments Canada 
or of any other organizations that I've consulted with or uh, previously been employed with. So yeah, these are personal views. I uh, just wanted to be clear um, about that point. Um, I'm trying to advance the slide here. Hi, there we go. I do have control. Great. So um, I just wanted to start off with a bit of a definition of a payment system. So it's important, and, and we deal with this in a lot more detail in the May um, webinar, but you didn't need to do the, the May webinar to be able to do this webinar. We talked a bit about payment systems and, and what do we actually mean by payment systems. So for me, the definitions that I always go back to are the definitions uh, that the Bank for International Settlements use. And, and uh, I always think that they, they, they spend a lot of time coming up with a, with a glossary of terminology, and uh, I would recommend anyone who's looking for uh, definitions on some of these issues is to, to go to the Bank for International Settlements website. Um, so their definition for a payment system is a set of instruments, procedures, and rules that transfer funds between or among participants. The systems include the participants and the entities operating the arrangement. So in the payment systems that I'm going to be talking about today are really traditional bank-based payment systems so that Generally, where the participants are financial institutions, uh, more often than not, they're banks uh, that operate within jurisdictions, and that there's usually some kind of central, um, like a, a automated clearinghouse or some other kind of system operator, which is facilitating the exchange of messages and of value between those participants. And it's actually within those participants, within those financial institutions, within those financial institutions. Um, that we actually are, uh, where the accounts are actually being held. Um, go to the next slide. So what's wrong with what we currently have? Um, so traditional payment systems, as I've mentioned, and I'm going to be talking primarily about those payment systems that involve banks. Um, uh, and, and quite often, they involve instruments that are quite well-established, checks. Uh, bulk electronic payment systems, they have limitations. These systems were created back in, uh, in developed markets back in the 1970s or 1980s, and as, as a result, they were really based on the technology of the day. So those systems are based on old technologies. Um, you know, checks have been around for hundreds of years, and you have to go to the 70s and 80s when microlines were introduced and check processing was automated to realize that a lot of the principles that were established there were adapted and um, reused in, in bulk electronic payment systems. Those systems quite often are uh, slow in terms of providing final value to the recipient, to the end user, the customer, uh, might not get value for a couple of days. So, um, say, for instance, a check or an electronic payment, say if I, uh, an old, um, say an EFT type transfer, I might uh, initiate that on a Friday, for instance, and I might say, oh, I want to send Leon $100 um, through, a, through an EFT using a traditional payment system. Well, I might initiate that payment on a Friday afternoon, but because of the clearing and settlement cycles and in terms of when the banks are open, when the payment system is open, and when the central bank is open, Leon might not get that value until you know Monday or Tuesday next week, even an electronic funds transfer. For a check, it's probably going to take even longer. He might not get value until sometimes at the end of the following week. Similarly, these traditional payment systems quite often operate on limited hours. The so processing will happen on a weekday, or during normal banking hours, you know, your sort of nine to five or uh, type basis. And more often than not, these traditional payment systems would carry limited data with, uh, with the payment. So uh, EFT type systems, so uh, uh, older style electronic banking systems might only be able to carry uh, 15 or 20 characters of data along with the payment, which meant that banks and other service providers had to develop um, workarounds to, to, to ensure that um, the data was actually, um, could actually go through. Um, and, and so as a result of these limitations, 
um, we we ended up with the problems that uh, with with our traditional payment systems. So what we have then is a need for speed. And so we've got the nice diagram, a picture there of Usain Bolt, uh, who was until recently the fastest man in the world. Um, and you see a lot of terms being used. So we have fast, we have faster, we have immediate, we have real time. Um, you know, to a certain degree, it's a bit semantic. And uh, and, uh, and I'll use fast payment systems here. Um, I'm not a huge fan of of, of, of real time. Uh, we had a lot of issues with real time in Australia because people would say, well, value isn't really received in real time. It's actually received a couple of seconds after the payment is initiated. So you don't want to use real time. Same with immediate. So fast, you know, or faster, I think more often than not, is probably a little bit more accurate if people want to get really picky around the terminology. So what is what are the things that have fostered this development? So obviously the emergence of e-commerce and the platform economy has really changed commerce and consumption. And I think we all recognize this. It's really changed how people consume, particularly in a retail environment. Um, there's been the wider impact of digital technology and obviously being uh, manifesting itself through mobile and internet. We expect services and goods to be frictionless. We expect things to be cheaper, quicker, and smarter. So as a result, traditional banking and payments look slow, expensive, and dumb by comparison. And by dumb, I don't mean to be insulting, but just the ability to, um, the ability to carry additional data, the ability to orchestrate a, a more seamless experience isn't really how those traditional banking based payment systems were created. They were created to move uh, value between financial institutions in a relatively secure and efficient manner. They weren't designed to be fast, or they might have been designed to be fast in 1970s or 1980s technology, but they weren't designed to be fast in 2017 technology. And as a result, um, you know, this is part of the drive of why um, fast payment systems are starting to get, um, get interest. So what are the basic features of a fast payment system? And, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I go back to a paper that was released in November of uh, last year by uh, the Bank for International Settlements and the CPMI, which is one of the committees of the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, the paper is actually listed in the sources section at the end. And they come up with a few very basic features of a fast payment system. So it, it involves a few basic things. So it's an account to account payment. So usually um, between accounts held at financial institutions. It involves 24 7, 365 operation. And, the, and there's immediate value to the recipient, usually in less than one minute. So according to the CPMI BIS definition of what a fast payment system is, that's what. Um, what they consider. And in their definition, and this is something that CPMI, CPMI BSI, BIS do, and also the recent flavors of FAST definition do, is to try to distinguish between FAST payment systems that are banking based from other types of uh, systems um, that are, um, you know, may, may provide for a similar type of experience. Okay, well, I'll move through here very quickly. Okay. So again, this is a diagram that we used back in uh, May to try to explain very, in a very, you know, very, very basic sense of how how a banking uh, bank-based payment system actually works. You have a payer and a payee at either end of the uh, of the transaction. Uh, you have commercial banks that are participants in that. You have a payment system in the middle that processes uh, the uh, the payment message and and the transfer of value. You'll have government and regulators over top of that quite often, and then you'll have a central bank, um, whereas more often than not, where final settlement will occur. Again, very, very, very simplistic, very stylized. Obviously, the payment flows and real systems are far more complex than this, and there's a lot of players involved, but this is to try to just provide it at a very, very simplistic, very simplistic level. So if we look at a traditional payment system, so what we've got here is um, batch processing. 
uh, happening within limited hours. So again, uh, electronic funds transfer within batch payment systems like BAX uh, in the UK or uh, BEX direct entry in Australia or even ACH in the United States. Quite often, these payments would be batched together. And processing would only happen at limited times within certain windows and also during certain periods of, uh, of, of the week. So it would be during weekdays uh, and it would be during normal banking hours. Um, quite often that means that the value that the payee um, would get would mean that they would get more often than not value next banking day. Um, and, and that settlement as well would quite often occur on the next day basis as well too. And again, on a limited hours basis because central banks don't operate again on a 24-7, 365 basis. So in a very simple term, what then does a fast payment system do? Well, first of all, and again, this is very simplistic and very stylized, it will provide for individual processing of payments and will operate on a 24-7, 365 basis. It usually will mean that there will be immediate value to the end user, to the payee, within one minute. And that settlement will occur at least on a multiple same day basis and in some instances on a real time basis. And again, there's some design variations here between systems, but again, at a, at a, at a, at a 60,000 foot level, this is effectively what a fast payment system does uh, differently uh, from a uh, traditional bank-based payment system. But as you see, a lot of the basic features and the basic architecture of it is quite similar. You have a payer and a payee at each end. You've got a commercial bank holding the account and participating in the payment system. You have settlement op happening at the central bank. So a lot of the architectural features of it are the same, but how the timing, the way in which things are processed is done differently. So in a way, it's similar to what we've seen in these old systems, but it has certain enhancements to try to deal with the challenges of the digital economy. So what are some of the other features we see in these fast payment systems? So um, again, and again, I'm, I'm, this is at a relatively high level. And there's lots of variation in color. And I think one of the things you learn as you spend more time with these fast payment systems is that there's a lot of variation between them. Um, as opposed to some other systems, say like real-time growth settlement systems that are operated by central banks, they have a tendency to be pretty similar in the way they operate. Um, there are some design differences, but those design differences are pretty modest. The design differences between fast payment systems appear to be, you know, reasonably, um, you know, along a continuum. And, and it's interesting the different flavors that you see. So um, for messaging in terms of the payment messages within a traditional payment system, uh, quite often they will rely on a proprietary message set. Whereas fast payment systems are increasingly relying on either ISO 20022, which provides for the ability to carry additional data, or ISO 8583, which is the, the, the standard which is traditionally used for, uh, for uh, international card scheme messages. In terms of the services that are offered on top of these systems, traditional payment systems generally don't define the service level, the use cases, the channels. That's left to the participant. So a check system or a bulk electronic payment system will basically just be a set of rails. It'll be an infrastructure. And then all of the pricing, all of the user experience um, will be done on top of that and quite often will be done by, uh, by participants. Um, Fast payment systems quite often will have their own service layer. Uh, quite often it's called an overlay service that uh, some or most or all of the participants may offer to their end users. A lot of these services we see have a P2P component, but increasingly we're seeing a service layer uh, happening on top of these fast payment systems that also it seeks to address um, government and business applications. 
Um, addressing, some payment systems have an addressing service, which means that they'll host some kind of proxy database, which allows for the sender to use a non-bank account-based identifier, such as an email, a mobile phone number, social media handle, whatever, to, to, uh, to affect the payment. Um, so that when I want to pay Leon, in a traditional uh, bank-based payment system, I would, if I wanted to send him an, an EFT, an electronic fund transfer, more often than not, I would have to know his bank account numbers and I'd have to know the, the routing or transit number for his financial institution. Uh, or if I wanted to send him a check, I would have to know his, at least his postal address, right? Um, um, so, for an electronic funds transfer in a, in a traditional payment system, I would need to know those account details. And that's complicated, right? People get it wrong, they're mistaking payments. Uh, sometimes people, for security reasons, are, are suggested not to provide those details to, to other people and so forth. So uh, a payment system that has an addressing, a fast payment system that has an addressing service would allow me, for instance, to pay Leon with his uh, mobile phone number or with his email address rather than necessarily having his bank account details. Um, fast payment systems often have a transaction limit uh, for fraud and risk management purposes. And uh, generally these systems have a tendency to be um, single currency and operate within a domestic regime. There are, there are very few uh, cross-border or multi-currency systems. Um, we're seeing some developments happening in that area, but generally these have a tendency to be single currency, um, uh, single jurisdiction uh, deployments. Uh, one final thing I didn't mention, and it's not on the slide here, and don't worry, it won't be in the quiz, is that most of these systems provide for a single credit transfer. Uh, they might also support uh, a request to pay but it's generally rare, though not unknown, for these types of uh, fast payment systems to support some kind of debit pull as well. So um, a few systems do that, it's not common, and generally the single credit transfer, the push payment, uh, is, the, is the most common type of, uh, of, of payment type that you would see in these types of deployments. So, what about the existing or emerging alternatives to fast payment systems? So I think one thing to think about, particularly for those of you who are, say, policymakers, um, you know, looking at trying to make sense of all of this, is that it, it is a relatively complicated environment and that bank-based payment systems operate alongside a lot of different other systems as well, too. So. Banks have been obviously offering credit cards um, for a long period of time, and they have proven relatively well suited for the digital environment. So banks have been relatively active in promoting the use of credit cards for, uh, for online purchasing, but um, they obviously have certain drawbacks. Um, the interchange fees uh, that are uh, charged uh, that, uh, that merchants uh, end up uh, paying in the long run. Um, the uh, fraud that takes place on credit card uh, transactions that are used online and fraud quite often for merchants results in chargebacks. So again, a cost borne by merchants. Um, the whole issue around control, um, there's a lot of issues here. And when I, when I was writing the slides, I was trying to reflect on what I meant by control. but um, control in terms of uh, the international card schemes being large international organizations and quite often, um, you know, I, I think policymakers in other jurisdictions are, have some concerns around them at some, to some time. Not necessarily that they have some kind of, um, you know, evil ulterior motive, obviously not. They do some amazing, incredible things and I think that the international card schemes have done some in, in, impressive stuff for a long period of time, but sometimes local uh, policymakers get concerned about wanting to be able to control their payment system in it within a domestic environment. 
Um, and ISO 8583 um, has a tendency, which is the data, which is the messaging standard used for credit cards, quite often only carries limited data as well too. So uh, it wasn't designed to carry the, the rich data that, that ISO 2022 uh, provides for. But car credit cards, credit cards have done amazingly well in the online environment and have proven to be very effective ways to be able to transact online and to be able to transact, um, you know, through mobile as well too. And then I think the card schemes have been very active in terms of trying to, to adapt and to evolve within this environment. But fast, fast payment systems, in a sense, are operating alongside these systems, and quite often they're distinct and separate from them. Uh, not always, but uh, more often than not, they're they're run separately. Um, so other non-bank-based alternatives have also emerged. So obviously, uh, mobile network operators um, offer offering quite often P2P payment solutions. Um, other payment service providers, uh, such as your PayPal, um, providing uh, providing online payment services as well. And, and again, fintechs and distributed ledger technologies, blockchain as well too. So if you're a policymaker looking at all of these alternatives, fast payment systems that are these bank-based fast payment systems are, are sort of operating alongside all of these other alternatives as well to, that also try to deal with issues of, of speed and immediacy uh, and trying to be more adapted to the digital environment. So in terms of the fast payment systems around the world, um, the, I, I've taken this from the flavors of fast report from uh, which was just released a couple of weeks ago or a week or so ago um, by FIS. It's a very good report, and they look at these these fast payment uh, systems around the world, and they they claim that or they they note that there's 25 systems that are currently live, uh, 11 in development, and uh, eight that are on the radar. Um, according to their report, and and I identify on the map here a few of the uh, examples. So, um, and uh, I won't go into all of these, but I will talk about a few of these in the in the coming slides. The one that I'm obviously most um, aware of is a new payments platform in Australia, which goes live in uh, October of this year. Uh, UK Faster Payments is probably the first. Um, kind of modern uh, fast payments deployment, though the Zengen system in Japan has been processing fast payments uh, for decades now. Um, but the newer types of deployments, uh, sort of the current generation, I think UK faster payments is sort of seen as being the, 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 the first sort of modern uh, fast payment system. And I'll talk a little bit about that because these kinds of payment systems are actually reasonably new. Uh, so UK Faster Payments started in, in 2018 uh, with, uh, and currently has 15 participants. So it is uh, evolving a new access model. It has deployed a new access model and is looking at really widening participation. Um, there is a scheme uh, operator, uh, which is the Faster Payment Scheme, though that is again going to be changed as a result of uh, some, uh, some reforms within the industry to try to consolidate um, some of the governance. Uh, however, the technology is provided by Vocalink, um, which uh, was uh, previously owned by the uh, UK, um, previously owned by the UK banks, but has uh, quite recently been acquired by MasterCard. Um, so some of the basic features of UK Faster Payments uh, is that it provides for a single credit transfer. There is no um, there's no debit functionality. So as I noticed at the end of the slide, there is a request to pay um, uh, offering coming soon. There are a number of overlay services that run across UK Faster Payments. Uh, PayM, probably the most well known, uh, which is a mobile P2P. Uh, and then there's also Zap, which uh, which was for merchant payments, probably not as successful, but uh, as PayM. But uh, yes, definitely uh, playing around with a few overlay services there. There's no addressing service within UK Faster Payments that actually fits within the overlay service. Um, there's a 250,000 pound limit in terms of a transaction limit, and the payment standard, the messaging standard, is 8583. Though there are plans to move to ISO. 
2022. Um, so we've seen a lot of them. One of probably one of the more interesting developing country um, uh, emerging market uh, deployments has been IMPS in India. So uh, that was uh, launched in 20. 2010 and, and now has well over 200 participants. Um, the operator is the National Payments Corporation of India. And uh, it's interesting in the flavors of FAST uh, report that came out, they actually rated it as the most open and innovative of the new FAST payment systems. Um, even though it is based on 8583, um, they have been doing a lot of work around a unified payments interface, which is enabling multiple overlays, They're really experimenting with APIs, um, addressing is a very strong component of that system uh, in terms of allowing to send payments via mobile and also some institutions allowing payments using uh, ADAR, which is the um, which is the national identity system, uh, which has been introduced as well too. So IMPS is uh, is a very interesting uh, and and has grown from a relatively low base. Um, but is uh, but has been growing quite strongly in in recent years. Uh, Sweden in 2010 introduced a BIR. Um, it has 10 participants. The operator is Bankshiro, again a bank-based um, sort of system operator. Uh, very similar in a lot of its design features to uh, to UK Faster Payments. It supports credit transfers. It has a single overlay uh, service called Swish, which uh, provides for mobile P2P. So it is based on ISO 20022, and it has a very unique way of dealing with, with settlement. So settlement is, uh, is done through a pre-funded account that's held at the uh, Central Bank of, uh, of Sweden, at the Reichsbank, and all of the participants um, basically pre-fund that single account, and that sort of supports uh, real-time line-by-line settlement, uh, which is a challenging uh, way of trying to uh, deal with that issue. Uh, Singapore introduced FAST in 2014, has 19 participants. Uh, the operator is the Association for Banks of Singapore, and it's a, uh, the technology provider is BCS. Uh, it is, some of its basic features is that it has a limit of 50,000 uh, Singaporean dollars. Um, it supports uh, both credit transfer and, and debit as well, too, and has no addressing service, though uh, one is being planned. Uh, I didn't check, double check before I finalized these slides. Uh, I think it's uh, not that far off their addressing service, so someone may, may be able to correct me to say that it's live now. Um, they've had some issues because paying with banks using FAST, you really need to use sort of bank-based identifiers, and that does create some, that has slowed down that system, I think, a little bit in terms of its uptake, because I have to know your account details and, and so forth, and I have to know whether or not it's eight or nine or ten digits and all that sort of stuff, and it was not not proving to be as uh, as seamless of a, of a user experience. So I think they're introducing the addressing service to address some of those issues. And lastly, the Australian new payments platform. I'm currently in Australia, as Leon mentioned. I, I'm splitting my time between Ottawa, Canada, and Sydney, Australia at the moment, which is quite interesting. Um, so that'll be commencing uh, later this year. So it'll be um, uh, starting in October of 2017. Uh, there are 13 participants in the new payments platform. Uh, the Australian banks created a new company called NPP Australia Limited. Uh, which includes shareholding by the uh, number of banks and the central bank as well. And the system will be, uh, the technology is provided by SWIFT, um, as well as uh, Fiserv was providing the addressing database. So um, it'll have a single credit transfer, so there'll be no debit functionality. The request to pay is, is proposed. The uh, first overlay service is called OSCO, uh, which is provided by BPAY, which will be a B, B, P to P service uh, through mobile. Uh, there is an addressing service called Pay ID, so I will be able to pay another Australian um, using their mobile phone number or using um, their um, email address, um, and uh, as opposed to having to have their bank account details. Um, and the messaging standard is ISO 20022. So in terms of the trends that we've seen, we've seen some very strong growth. And, and, and the stats that I'm showing you are from that BIS 
uh, report from November of last year. So, um, so the UK faster payments, we saw you know reasonably good growth uh, between the launch in 2008 to 2011, and then we've seen quite significant growth over the past five years, both in terms of volumes and value. Again. Um, these are, you know, these are these are absolute numbers. They're not relative numbers. Fast payment systems in most jurisdictions are relatively small compared to credit card volumes and values, check, um, uh, traditional electronic funds transfer, and high value. They're still relatively small amounts. Okay. Um, here are some of the numbers for IMPS, same thing, strong growth, and Swedish BIR. Again, very, very strong growth. So I'll just quickly go through a few of uh, other developments. So in the US, um, the Federal Reserve Task Force uh, that was established, uh, uh, the US Federal Reserve established a task force on faster payments in June of 2015. Uh, that um, task force released its final report uh, in July. I was fortunate enough to be able to participate in the task force. And uh, they made 10 recommendations, though they did indicate a reliance on market forces. So, um, but the recommendations around governance and regulation, infrastructure and sustainability and evolution. So really standard space, really trying to facilitate, catalyze the environment, not as directive as say some other jurisdictions where central banks may have played a more, more activist role in trying to get these faster payment systems uh, developed. Um, there are a number of US faster payment systems. So the Clearinghouse is uh, launching its real-time payment system later this year. And early warning services, Vell, uh, is uh, currently live uh, with nine participating banks. So that's uh, pretty exciting stuff that's happening in the States. Uh, in Europe, uh, Got to keep an eye on the time here. So SEPA instant credit, uh, instant single credit transfer scheme has been developed. And again, Europe's different in this sense because we're not talking about an infrastructure. We're talking about a set of rules. That'll be commencing in November 2017. There's a 15,000 euro maximum. However, the the, the scheme is, is voluntary for payment system providers and banks in, in the EU. So it's not, it's not a compulsory thing. It's very closely related to the single credit transfer SEPA scheme that has been around for a number of years, but again is trying to trying to sort of move into that into that fast payments environment. So in terms of the growth of these systems, so like I said, we've gone from basically sort of a handful to now, you know, a couple of dozen implementations and more plans. So if you look at this slide here, this is sort of from a, from a BIS quarterly um, uh, report uh, back in March of last year, very good article. Again, they'll be in my sources at the back, where they look at the diffusion of fast payment systems. So on the left-hand side of the slide, you see the actual diffusion. So the red line on the far left is the growth of RTGSs, the real-time growth settlement systems. So in the 80s and 90s, we saw very you know, low, slow growth. And then about 1995, it takes off. And for the next 15 years, between 1995 and 2010, we see this massive uptake of RTGS systems. Um, what the authors of this article say, this March uh, 2017 article say, is that they're seeing a similar pattern with fast payment systems. So fast payment systems are the blue. And when you line up the blue line with the red line, you see, oh, okay, we're kind of at the start of the S curve. We're right at the very beginning of an explosion of fast payment systems occurring um, across um, these, uh, you know, a multiplicity of jurisdictions. So the, the, so the dozens that we have now could end up being, you know, hundreds eventually. So if we have, say, one per jurisdiction sort of thing, we could end up with a couple of hundred of these systems. So what are the challenges for fast payment systems? I'm in the home stretch now, which is probably good because we want to get the Q&A. Um, so what are the challenges for these fast payment systems that they get introduced? Well, um, they have strong competition. They're moving into a crowded market. Um, international card schemes, mobile network operators, and fintechs are all offering some very attractive solutions out there. And it can be very hard 
for these initiatives to 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 be as um, to 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 take hold. Um, quite often, they require industry collaboration. They require banks to come together, and banks are generally competitive. And to get them to get together and collaborate is not necessarily the easiest thing to do. Fast payment systems again there may not necessarily be a clear business case for banks. Um, what's the business case for a single credit transfer um, beyond just mobile P2P? And if I can do mobile P2P through something that's offered by uh, a partner, you know, a, a card scheme or uh, a payment service provider, then why should I build this fast payment system? And that's one of the reasons why these systems are building in additional features like addressing services or having ISO 20022 to, and, and supporting multiple overlay systems. Um, and achieving ubiquity and interoperability can be very, very difficult. So fast payment systems work best when most accounts can be reached and when most banks participate. So I've got the example here of, Elec uh, of Elixir Express in Poland. So, this was in, you know, back in around 2009, 2010, sort of a couple of years after UK faster payments, the Polish banks came together to create their own fast payment system, uh, and Elixir Express was the, was the outcome of that. Part of the problem with Elixir Express was that not all of the major Polish banks signed up to that. I think that's being addressed now, but uh, that meant that not everyone was participating and so therefore I if I wanted to pay Leon I would only be able to give him a payment through Elixir Express if I knew his bank was participating as well too and if I didn't if I wasn't sure then I wouldn't necessarily want to use that service. I think that's being addressed now but these systems really work if most if not all of the banks in a in a jurisdiction are participating. Going to move. Ooh. Uh, yep. Okay. Here we go. So the implications of these challenges mean that central banks often have an important role to play as a catalyst. So in their role as regulator or as participant or a system operator, central banks have been crucial in a number of these implementations. Uh, in places like Australia, for instance, the Reserve Bank of Australia played a very important role through its policy processes and in terms of its role as a provider of settlement services of really getting the new payments platform off the ground. That's not uncommon to see the central bank playing an important role in trying to catalyze these kinds of systems because the collaboration can be very difficult. Uh, national banking or payment associations or national system operators can also help play an important facilitation and coordination role. And often fast payment systems are done in the context of a strategic review or an industry roadmap. So that's way, that, those are some of the ways you can get around some of those previous problems. Oh, I've got one minute left. So what are some of the implications for emerging markets? Well, I think a well-designed fast payment system aligns with the Gates Foundation Level 1 principles. And I know there's a presentation about that in September and I really recommend you doing that. Costa Peric's doing it, and he's great. He's really, really good on this stuff. And, and a lot of what level one talks about is the importance of having an open loop system, not a closed loop system. Being able to facilitate competition and having a number of players rather than just having one entity kind of controlling the entire ecosystem. And I think that a well-designed fast payment system does that. However, these fast payment systems are best suited where you have a highly banked population. Uh, it may not be suitable where there's a high proportion of mobile phone owners who are unbanked. So if you're a policymaker or someone in a central bank, I think, you know, do you need a fast payment system? Well, I think you need to look at what you currently have. Uh, you need to look at your population. Are they, are they highly banked or are they not highly banked? Um, and there is no one best way. So even if you decide that you think your ecosystem needs a fast payment system or not, once you get into that, there's, there's a lot of design choices. Um, and, and there's no one best way. So markets need to have some process to be able to arrive at the solutions that balance competition and collaboration and meet participant and end user needs. 
So, so really robust process is really important to make sure that you get the right design for your, for your ecosystem. Um, there's some further readings. Um, I would, uh, hopefully we can make those available somewhere online. Uh, they're all really, really good reports. So Gates, Flavors of Fast, and the two BIS reports I said before. I think I'm right on 8, um, 8.15 uh, Eastern time. So I think it's now time to go to, uh, to Q&A. Okay. Um, Rory McMillan, can, well, I've got, can you say something about, oh, well, I just went away not, there. Not Sorry. yet. Uh, not yet. Um, uh, Brad, uh, we, we've, we're going to do some polls first, right? Um, but thank you very much for that. Uh, I think what you've demonstrated is that uh, that this is a, a growing trend. Uh, I'm glad to see the uh, emerging markets uh, come to the fore, especially Nigeria. I think they've found uh, maybe a solution to what you said about uh, um, uh, bank uh, countries with unbanked populations not necessarily having a a good rationale for faster payments. Nigeria seems to have uh, found that with NIBS. Um, mm -hmm. But generally, uh, payments that are, are reliable, faster, and um, efficient are, are, are certainly welcome. So we, we're going to have, a, uh, as I said, uh, two polls um, coming up um, on your right. We just want to know um, what your organization type is. So there's a few uh, seconds, about 30 seconds to do that. Uh, while you're doing that, just to remind you that the quiz um, is following shortly after the webinar on the on the half hour. So the quiz link is in your email that was sent to you. So uh, um, email info at dfsobservatory.com if you can't log in. So again, the quiz is available for two hours from, from the end of the webinar. Uh, also, just a little uh, uh, advertisement, we're working on some policy papers on um, uh, de-risking and blockchain DLT and financial inclusion. So if you have any examples, good examples of use of DLT's blockchain and in, in financial inclusion context, please send it to info at DFS Observatory. Similarly, uh, if you have any good examples of de-risking, examples of entities being de-risked and those um, doing the de-risking, such as MMOs, Please uh, send it to info at davisobservatory.com and you um, so thank you for that. Okay, um, and while we call up the next poll, just a overview of the webinars uh, that are coming up. Um, September 8th, as I mentioned earlier, is on uh, interoperability in DFS. Then we've got fraud on September 20th. Level one, Brad mentioned with Costa from Gates Foundation, September 22nd, uh, 7th. October 10th is competition aspects of DFS. Then introduction to payment technology, October uh, 19th. October 26th is RegTech and its use in financial inclusion. Um, and then November 8th, the risking and the impact on financial inclusion. So you'll see the poll on your right hand side if you want to uh, just uh, fill that in. Uh, just to say also, we're having our risking round table. That's a physical event in New York on uh, October the 12th, uh, 2017. That will be, uh, the registration links will be sent out shortly. Um, you're very welcome um, to attend. Okay. Um, while we uh, do the, wait for the poll to end, um, question from Rory. Macmillan, the double L in DC. Uh, can you say something about competition issues that arise amongst payment systems, e.g. network effects exclusion of new payment systems due to lack of interoperability? Okay, um, Brad, over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Rory. That's a, that's a very good question. I, I mean, I think, again, looking at my experience in Australia, I think competition was very much at front and center of what we thought about. And I think we realized that, um, that, e that even a system like the new payments platform was competing against other infrastructures and, and other payment systems. So, so the payment systems will be operating and will be competing against each other. I think one thing we tried to do in the design of new payments platform, and I think a lot of the fast payment systems are trying to do, is to say that 
there will be a there will be a, sort of a single infrastructure that will be supporting multiple competing uh, overlay services. So our view is very much that that the ubiquity and the interoperability should be at that infrastructural level, and and that that should be based around certain uh, common technology, um, common use of, of payment stand of uh, messaging standards and so forth but that the competition should be happening above that. It should be happening at the service layer and that that's where you really want the dynamism to go. So that means that issues around things like access um, become very, very important. And uh, in terms of trying to creating a facilitating an open environment through the deployment of things like APIs become very important as well too. So, um, yeah, I, I I think it's a it's a it's a it's a tough issue, but uh, but I think you you definitely want to try to de-layer these systems as much as possible. Uh, thank you, Brad, and thank you, Rory, again. Uh, from Ahmed in Cairo, his question is: What are the cost and time implications for installing a faster payment system? Right, um, fast payment systems are not necessarily uh, quite cheap. Um, Australia's new payments platform, in the end, probably cost the industry and the banks um, in total one billion Australian dollars, which is probably about um, 800 million uh, US dollars. But that's both center costs and uh, cost for the FIs as well too. But that was a that was a totally new build. Um, I think a lot of the deployments that you see are some are new builds um, from the scratch from scratch from the ground up, and they have a tendency to be more expensive and to take a longer period of time. I think that those deployments that try to um, that try to leverage existing infrastructure um, quite often can bring down some of the the project risks and compress some of the cost and time frames. Um, thanks, Brad. Just a quick follow-up question from Sue in Nairobi. Um, is there, a, uh, I think to paraphrase a question, uh, a fast payments light system that uh, is slightly cheaper that could be installed in emerging markets? Yeah, I mean, I've heard a little bit about this as well, too, and I think that um, I, I think that the technology increasingly is allowing us to consider that, and I think that people are thinking a bit more about that in terms of the design of, of some of these systems. I think uh, I, I think some of the the systems that we saw designed, like even the the UK and Australian systems, are, are pretty heavy pretty heavy center costs. Um, but I think we're seeing a lot more lighter. Deployments and I and I think that um, you know a layered approach and much more modular approach means that yeah we can definitely bring about um, some of the benefits without necessarily having the the really expensive uh, in investments. Just a, a question you might know the answer to: Nigeria's NIP system, for example, though it's got a heavy mobile component to it, do you know approximately a ballpark what they would have spent on that? No, I don't. I don't have that information. Sorry, okay. um, but I, but I think some of those uh, some of those emerging market deployments they've been able to to reuse um, components of existing infrastructure and been able to keep the cost down. Okay, great. Uh, keep the questions coming, folks. Uh, from Sunil in Mumbai, uh, his question: Given the expertise and capacity needed to start a faster payment system. What would you recommend central banks in emerging markets do to kickstart the needed capacity process? Right. Uh, I mean, I think it all depends on what the mandate of that central bank is. Um, if the mandate of the central bank is operator, uh, policymaker, or participant, then I think that will define what they're able to do. Um, I think uh, central banks can play a very, very important role uh, in terms of trying to facilitate and catalyze that conversation. But I think as well, to make sure that they do it properly, I think central banks need to bring, um, you know, sometimes need to commit resources as well too. I think in Australia, they committed to building the fast settlement service and, 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 and wearing some of those costs. So I think sometimes the central banks are prepared to 
to carry some of the load, um, I think that that that's a sign of goodwill, and I think that can really help uh, help get these things uh, along. Okay, uh, from Deborah Bexley, what impact do you predict fast payments would have uh, on card spend volume? Oh, very interesting. I, I think one of the concerns that you hear expressed by banks is cannibalization of uh, card card volumes and values, and obviously uh, card um, payments are quite uh, lucrative for banks in terms of interchange. Um, in terms of interchange revenue, I, I, I actually would question that. I think, um, you know, I, I don't. I think we're seeing card and faster payment systems are eating into uh, cash. They're eating into checks. They're eating into older style EFTs. I mean, you go to jurisdictions like the UK, and you're not seeing card spend drop off. Um, you know, I, I really would be very surprised if if it might it might dampen it a little bit, but cards um you know card growth in most jurisdictions you know has been like double digit so um yeah I really you know I really struggle to see fast payment systems really eating into that significantly. Just a follow up question or related question I should say from Munir Bella. Uh what is who is best suited to build a fast payment system, the central bank or payment or bank association or even others? Oh, a great question. Look, I think it depends on how mature the, um, you know, the, the national payment association or the system operator is in that jurisdiction. Look, I think if, if, the, if those institutions are not very mature or robust or well-developed, then it may fall back on the central bank. But, but I mean, personally, my view is ideally, uh, I think even central bankers would want to see some benefit of industry actually owning and operating this um, in terms of the in terms of the commitment they would make in terms of getting the right kinds of expertise around the table um, and and making sure that it's designed in a way that it reflects participant needs and and participants are prepared to use it. You do not want a faster payment system to be just a compliance build. You want it to be something that participant banks are prepared to use and offer to their end users. Otherwise, it's not going to be a success. Yeah, um, wise words. Um, from Amol in India, your comments on regulatory architecture of payments. Should central bank do it and also run the um, RTGS or should be their separate regulator or advisory body? So it's kind of a related question, but slightly differently uh, phrased. Yeah, look, my, my, my view is that um, I, I think a separate payments regulator makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I think uh, it's, I, I see David uh, Birch is on, on, as one of the participants here, and he's made a very good point about banking and payments uh, have become very separate. And I think they have become very separate. And I think in that sense, I think that the regulation needs to reflect that, that, that payments needs to be regulated separately from banking. And I think that payments regulation by central banks is probably a bit of a historical hangover from an earlier era. I, I, I think central banks quite often do a very, very good job of it. But again, I'm not necessarily, you know, they probably do a better job than anyone else can do. Um, but I think ideally you would want to have a standalone payments regulator. Uh, but again, you want that standalone payments regulator to be able to understand the complexities of payment systems, the, the the challenges of coordination and the benefits of the network effects as well. So you want them to be able to be aware of that and to understand the challenges that, that are faced by industry. Great. I think um, we can end now. Uh, it's on the half hour. Thank you, Dr. Pragnall, for your uh, insights and insightful comments. Uh, we couldn't have had a better person to present on faster payments. I think we've all learned something. Um, for those who have asked, um, the, uh, the webinar uh, will be in our archive within a few days, probably by Friday. Um, so go to the, um, the, the events section of dfsobservatory.com and you'll see that in the uh, other webinars. And in fact, may I also point you to a presentation. Um, there's a recording there from our conference 
from the Federal Reserve on, on um, the U.S. Faster Payments Initiative. So that's also there. It's about a 15-minute uh, talk. So um, what's coming up now, of course, is the quiz for those who want to do it and earn the certificate. So if you do six um, uh, webinars and do pass uh, six quizzes at 60%, you get the certificate. So that's live just uh, right now. Uh, and good luck for that. If you pay careful attention to Dr. Pragnall's slides, you, you'll get through the, the quiz quite easily. Um, and again, please register, if you will, for the forthcoming webinars. The next one, again, is on September the 6th on interoperability in um, DFS. So it remains for me to wish everybody, we've had a record um, crowd online today, uh, wish everybody from around the world uh, a good morning. Um, and a good afternoon and a good evening and a good night to Dr. Pragnall. It's 10.30 at night in Australia. So we, again, we thank him for staying up late to provide his insights. So bye-bye from New York and have a great day and night.